All right, before we talk about the genomes individually, I want to tell you what is and what is not encoded in a virus genome because they're very different from, from ours, of course. They're much smaller, and so they don't have the luxuries of, of encoding all the proteins that we do. These kinds of things are encoded. Uh, proteins that you need to replicate the genome, of course, to assemble a particle, to package the genome in the particle, to time the replication cycle. You know, we make proteins that regulate transcription. Viruses do the same thing. Modulation of host defenses. This is a pretty recent discovery in virology. Viruses make proteins that overcome host defenses. If they didn't do this, they wouldn't exist. Every virus that we know of encodes at least prote one protein that antagonizes immune responses. They have to because immune responses are so good. And finally, they encode proteins that allow the viruses to spread uh, to, to other cells or spread through the air, through an aerosol, for example. <clears throat> okay, what's not encoded in a genome? Lots of things are not encoded. Uh, no genes encoding the complete protein synthesis machinery. When I started teaching this course, I said four years ago, that used to say no part of the protein synthesis machinery. And then we discovered Mimi viruses which encode uh, amino acyl tRNA synthetases and other initiation proteins. So now the Mimis don't have the whole thing. They don't have ribosomes and tRNAs and all the proteins you need, but they have a, a part of it. No virus can do the whole thing. That's, where, that's why they're translational parasites. They can't make energy on their own. They can't respire. They can't do respiration. They can't make membranes. They have to get all of that from the cell. They don't have telomeres or centromeres either. They have some things that look like them, but uh, not really what, what is in our cells. Now, you could argue that we just haven't discovered them yet in viruses, and that's fair because most of the viruses out there we don't know of. They remain to be really studied. But I would argue that once, as I said before, once you find a complete protein synthesis machinery encoded in a virus genome, it's getting pretty close to a cell, although maybe it still can't make energy and, and make membranes. But it would be really interesting to find those. Because, you know, one of the ideas for the evolution of viruses is that they came from cells. They left cells with a package of genes. So the question is, what genes did they initially have? And maybe there are some old viruses around that still have the original sets of genes that could inform us. And then they decided they didn't need to carry a protein synthesis machinery, for example. All right, so let's first talk about our uh, DNA genomes. So we have DNA, viruses replicate in us, and so for the most part, the way viral DNA replication happens for these DNA viruses, it emulates the host. Um, but most DNA genomes are not like cell chromosomes, as I've just told you. They're not chromosomes. Uh, there are some people who want to call them chromosomes, but they're not. They don't have the histones associated with them. They're not all coiled up in that way, although some of them look a bit like uh, the coiled status of, of, of our DNA, but they're not the same. They don't have telomeres and so on. But these viral DNA genomes are different because they've evolved ways to do things, to replicate their genomes and segregate them and so forth that, that differ from ours. And that's to be expected once you separate them uh, from the host cell. So here are the viruses with double-stranded uh, DNA genomes that we'll mainly talk about in this course. Uh, and, you know, as we go through the stages of replication, we'll make reference to these. As we talk about disease, we will also make reference to these as well. So these are all viruses that infect mammals. Lots of other viruses with these genomes that infect, that infect plants and bacteria and all, all sorts of other forms of life. But uh, we're not going to be talking about them because they're not studied very much. So we don't know a lot about them. Adenoviruses, this you'll recognize. It looks like a satellite. It has a very interesting virion with these projections. We'll talk about that. Hepatitis B virus. Now, these are all family names here. Remember, adenoviridae means it's a family, so it's always capitalized and italicized. And one member of adenoviridae is adenovirus. Hepatitis B virus. Uh, that might be hard for you to pick up from a diagram. Herpes viruses, these big guys, really quite large viruses with a lot of seemingly junk between the membrane and the capsid. We'll talk a lot about those. And then two rather small viruses, papillomaviruses. These are the viruses that cause warts. And polyomaviruses, which can infect many different animals, including us. And most of the ones that infect us uh, 
don't seem to cause anything, although there are some exceptions. They're rather small with no membranes, as you'll see. And finally, the pox viruses, which are quite large and complicated. And um, there are bigger viruses than this. As we said, the Mimi viruses are bigger, but we're not going to talk much about them because we don't know much about them. Now, uh, the genomes of these viruses have different configurations, and they come in different sizes, and that has implications. So let's first look at the information flow. So a virus with a double-stranded DNA genome. Remember, if you do the Baltimore scheme approach, you put mRNA here, and then you ask, how do we get to mRNA? Well, if you're double-stranded DNA, it's easy, because DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, PAL2, say, in your cell, can copy a double-stranded DNA template and make RNA. That's what it does for a living. So you can go right to mRNA from double-stranded DNA. That is, that is very easy. So in these viruses, when they get into the cell, they make mRNA. So to do that, they have to go into the nucleus for the most part. There's one exception, which I'll tell you. Go in the nucleus, make mRNA. That has to go back out in the cytoplasm. This is normal cell biology to make proteins. The genome has to replicate. So it goes from double-stranded to double-stranded DNA. We will talk about the mechanisms involved with that. And then eventually the DNA, the newly made DNA and the proteins make new particles. All right? So the, the couple of key things here, knowing that you can make mRNA right from a double-stranded DNA genome, and where this has to happen. So in the cell, our mRNAs are made in the nucleus by Paul 2 and most viruses will use that if they don't encode a Paul 2 So most viruses will have to go into the nucleus. Now, on the left are two of the smaller uh, DNA virus genomes, viruses with double-stranded DNAs again. These are the polyomaviruses and the papillomas, five kilobases and eight kilobases, 5,000 and 8,000 bases long. And these happen to be double-stranded circles of DNA. Right? So they're covalently closed, they're twisted, they're supercoiled, and all of that. They're rather small. They don't encode a lot of proteins. And these are typically copied by host DNA polymerase because they don't have enough room to encode DNA polymerase and all the proteins that you need, so they use host enzymes. They do encode at least one protein that modifies the DNA machinery in some way. That will be a theme. But these smaller viruses use the host DNA replication machinery. They also use the host transcriptional machinery. They use PAL2 to make mRNA. So these genomes have to go in the nucleus to make RNA and to replicate. On the right are genomes that are bigger, and these genomes, therefore, can co encode their own DNA polymerase. The adenovirus genome, for example, uh, between 36 and 48,000 bases long. It's a single strand of double-stranded DNA. Um, it is unusual because it has a protein linked to the five prime ends, so that's one of these funny modifications that I talked about. And we'll, we'll talk later about what that's for. Herpes viruses genomes are bigger. They range between 120,000 and 220,000 base pairs. Now, I don't want you to know how big these genomes are. I just want you to know that big genomes encode DNA polymerase and small ones do not. That's the concept that is important. And finally, the pox virus genomes between 130 and 375 kilobase pairs. Now, the, the herpes genomes are, are simply double-stranded linear molecules, nothing unusual there. They have some interesting repeated sequences that we'll talk about later. The pox virus genome is also double-stranded linear, but the ends are covalently linked. I mentioned this earlier. Okay, so both ends, the five and three prime ends at each end are covalently joined. So if you denatured this molecule, it would just make a single-strand circle. Now, these viruses can encode <coughs> their own DNA polymerases. They also encode a lot of other enzymes as well. The one virus in this group that, that doesn't need to get into the nucleus to replicate is the pox virus. It's the biggest. And the Mimi viruses also turn out not to need to get into the nucleus. So they have the biggest genomes. They encode all the DNA replication machinery. They encode an RNA polymerase and all the factors you need for that. And they set up their, their replication sites in the cytoplasm. They don't care about the nucleus whatsoever. So that's the advantage of having a big genome. So these may be very old viruses, the earliest descendants from cells where they still had a lot of uh, genes derived from the host cell. All right, let's turn to the gapped double-stranded DNA genomes. These are the, the hepatitis B viruses. When these were discovered, they were just thought to be completely weird because look at this configuration. You have a double-stranded circular uh, DNA molecule. There's a gap, so it's not completely double-stranded. So you can see the gap here 
and there's a little piece of RNA attached to one of the strands. That's the green bit here. And then there's also a protein. So this has lots of weird modifications. All of these make sense in terms of the way the virus genome replicates. So we will talk about that later. So you, you'll understand completely why there's a protein on here, why it's gapped, why there's a piece of RNA. By the way, most of these figures I'm showing you have a color convention. So mRNA plus stranded RNA, RNA is this uh, uh, Kelly green, light green, if you will. Uh, DNA, the, the plus strand is this uh, darker blue, and the minus strand is the light blue. So you can see here, this is the negative strand of DNA, the light blue color. This is the plus strand of DNA in the hep B genome. And this is a piece of, uh, of plus strand RNA, because it's the right color green. All right, so this genome, when it gets into the cell, can't be copied to make RNA. No Pol2 in a cell can copy this, because it has a gap, and it has a protein, and it has RNA. There's just no way that Pol2 can do anything to it. And I mean, one way of looking at this is that in terms of mRNA synthesis, the only substrate is really a double-stranded DNA. So any kind of genome you see, if it's not double-stranded DNA, the first thing that has to be done when it gets into the cell is it has to be made into a double-stranded DNA molecule. So these weird hep B genomes get repaired. They become completely double-stranded. The RNA is taken off, protein is taken off, and then they can make mRNA. Now, this uh, virus is unusual because it also <laughs> it does this strange business of making uh, another RNA from the double-stranded DNA. It's actually the same enzyme that makes both RNAs. But this pool of mRNAs, it converts to DNA, first single and then double-stranded, and that's what it packages in the genome. So the genome has DNA in it, and it gets that not by replicating the DNA, but by making an RNA and then making a DNA copy of it. I can't tell you why it does this. We have no idea. It just worked at some time, and it still works. All right, so that's the information flow uh, for hepatitis B virus. Single-stranded DNA genomes. Single strands can't be copied into mRNA. Remember that. Only double-stranded DNA among the DNAs can be copied into mRNA. So a virus with a single-stranded DNA genome, whether it's packaging either the plus or the minus strand, has to be converted to double-stranded DNA, which is then transcribed by the host uh, RNA polymerase. And then you make proteins. This genome replicates, and it makes single strands as it replicates. And as I said earlier, uh, these viruses tend to package one or the other a mixture of both. We don't know why. It's not exclusively plus or minus. It's a mixture. Uh, there are <clears throat> two different genome configurations uh, for these viruses, um, single-stranded DNA genomes, circoviruses, 1.7 to 2.2 kb, very small genomes, only encoding a few proteins, one or two proteins, really amazing that these viruses can uh, replicate. Single-stranded circular DNA genome. An example of a circovirus is TT virus. And this is a virus that has infected 90% of you. If I took your blood, 90% of you would have antibodies to this virus. You have no idea what it does. If anything, probably doesn't cause any disease. Maybe it helps us. <clears throat> we don't know. It, there are many related forms that infect other animals as well. And there's some pathogenic. There's some serious diseases of chickens that are caused by circoviruses. Uh, the other genome configuration is shown by the parvoviridae. These have linear DNA, single-stranded linear DNA genomes. The ends are base paired to form these uh, panhandle structures. And these have a role in genome replication, as you'll see. An example of a parvovirus is B19 parvo. It causes fifth disease. It's a childhood rash disease after measles and mumps and rubella and chickenpox. Mumps, rubella, four. And that's the fifth disease that you get as a child if you have a a dog, you have to immunize them against canine parvoviruses, otherwise you, you could lose them. 